Hi, and welcome to the Modern Persian Food Podcast. We are food bloggers, Bita Arabian and Bita Nazim Kelly, and we're here to share with you the rich flavors and fresh ingredients of Persian cooking and how to incorporate them into today's modern lifestyles. We're excited to introduce you to the flavors, tastes, and techniques we use, and also our own cultural stories and perspectives growing up in the U.S. in a Persian family. Thank you for joining us. Today, we are recording episode number 34, talking about Persian ice cream. Delicious, mouth-watering, great on a hot day ice cream, and specifically a traditional Persian ice cream. In Farsi, we call ice cream bastani, and this traditional ice cream is also sometimes known as Akbar Mashti. I'm joined today by the lovely Bita. Hi, Bita. Hi, Bita Jun. How are you? Doing well, thank you. So we're talking about ice cream. Yeah. What can you tell us about Bastani? Yeah, Bastani. Bastani is such a Persian treat. It has those familiar Persian flavors of saffron and rose water in a cold, delicious treat. Like you said, on a hot day, that sounds delicious. Or after a great meal, or just at the end of the day, just sneaking a little bowl of bastani. And what's really special about Persian ice cream as well is that it has frozen chunks of cream mixed in. And a lot of times pistachios in there as well. And again, like the rose water and the saffron really make it Persian And it's super delicious. Have you ever made Persian ice cream? Just in a cheat type of way. I don't have an ice cream maker. However, you can just take a tub of vanilla ice cream and, you know, let it soften a little bit so you can stir it. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, so we've just cheated and made our own version by adding the flavors in just a touch of rose water, as well as definitely saffron, some shelled chopped pistachios. And sometimes we'll take some heavy whipping cream, just basically some thick, heavy cream Mm -hmm. to make it seem a little bit more like the traditional ice cream. You can freeze the cream sort of like in a freezer bag and freeze it and then break it up and then stir in the cream. So traditional Persian Bassani has, like you said, like the chunks of cream in it. Yeah. That makes it really delicious. Do you have an ice cream maker? I don't have an ice cream maker, but you know, something to note about the Persian ice cream, it's really rich when we are trying to find the ice cream that we're going to buy. We always love to get ice cream that has eggs in it. So it's like really kind of custardy and really delicious and extra rich. And Persian ice cream is definitely like that. So if you are going to do the cheap version, I just recommend using like a really high quality ice cream. I don't have an ice cream maker. I've never actually made Bastani from scratch, but there's definitely a bunch of recipes available using good quality milk and cream, eggs, and then again, the rose water and the saffron and pistachios and some recipes include some vanilla in there as well. But the cheat recipe, you know, it just makes it a little bit more accessible. Like if you can't get to a Persian market or you don't go to a restaurant that has that ice cream that you can kind of make that at home. I actually love the Persian ice cream in like a little ice cream sandwich. So traditionally when they would have the ice cream sandwich, Persian style is like with two thin wafers. So it's not like really thick, but it's very delicate. And it's like a beautiful presentation and it's individual and it's super delicious. In some of the Persian markets in the freezer section, they have individually wrapped ice cream sandwiches. Have you seen those before? Yes, I grab them whenever I see them. I love them as well. What I really like about the Persian ice cream sandwiches is that the wafer, as you mentioned, it's really thin. It's also not sweet. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. It's plain. I appreciate that because you get the crunch and the texture of the wafer, but it doesn't take away from the flavor of the ice cream. Mm -hmm. I just don't love like overly sweet desserts. To me, it's overpowering to have like a really sugary cone and then a really sugary ice cream and then like a really sugary topping. But this way, it's just still about the ice cream, but then you just get that nice light crunch. I love those. Yes. Yeah, it balances it out. It's delicious. Have you ever stacked and made your own little ice cream sandwiches at home? Yeah, I've done that. And I've actually, for a party, have done like a platter of ice cream sandwiches. And that's always like a fun way. And you can kind of put additional pistachios like around the sides of the ice cream sandwich to just like amp it up a little bit. Tell me more about that. That sounds like it would be really nice, you know, with summer around the corner and more outdoor 
you know, hopefully parties happening. So do you assemble your Persian ice cream sandwich in advance and put it in the freezer or do you do it right before you serve it? So the problem of doing it right before you serve it is that it actually takes a while, especially if you have to like scoop the ice cream individually and make the little sandwiches. It can just take too long. I don't necessarily, if I'm entertaining, want to be like assembling ice cream sandwiches while, you know, everyone's waiting. And especially if you're making more than just a few of them, the first ones will start to melt off. So you can actually assemble them in advance and then put it in like on a tray in the freezer. And then when it comes out, pass it around. I love that idea. And then where do you find the wafers? There's wafers that you can get from like a specialty grocery store that basically like a very plain flat cracker wafer. Very clever, clever and creative. And then you just take it, you assemble it and you roll the ice cream Mm -hmm. edge into the pistachio. Yeah. Or you could kind of use your hands to help kind of like pat it onto there. Yeah. And it probably looks really lovely too. the presentation. It makes me want to have a party right now. Yeah. Especially as the weather's getting warmer. There's another kind of Persian ice cream. Actually, it's more of a sorbet, falude. Mm -hmm. That actually has rose water as well, but with like vermicelli noodles. And it's like a frozen treat. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people like to enjoy that with lime and sometimes some Persian cherry syrup. I usually have only really seen those at like restaurants. Or I think you could get like a little tub of it from the Persian market as well. Yeah, you can. Falude is definitely heavier in rose water flavor. Mm -hmm. And in restaurants, you can order half ice cream, half falude, and they call that makhlut, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that's the word for mixed. So you have like a mix of a little bit of ice cream and a mix of the frozen noodle rose water delight. Yeah, those are all delicious. And then there's also another treat that I know some people are kind of like fanatic about it. Ob Havij Bastani. Have you had that before? No, but on my mom's most recent trip back to Iran, she got to go sort of as a tourist and go to all the beautiful places. And, you know, I lived vicariously through her food pictures Aww. and scenery pictures, but mm-hmm. there was almost always a beautiful carrot ice cream float. I'm not sure what the Farsi name of it was like a carrot ice cream float on the table. Uh And I would ask them, what is that? And it often was beautiful and in a tall glass, like a float. Yep. I have not tried it, but it seemed to be really popular. Op Havij Bastani, it's just like a float. So, you know, I think Western culture is more familiar with like root beer floats or even like Coke floats, but it's just basically the ice cream. So typically the Persian ice cream is used, but vanilla ice cream would be a great substitute if you don't want to use the Persian ice cream and have a few scoops of it in a nice tall glass and then serve it with carrot juice. You know, I'm a huge carrot juice fan. So people love this flow and it kind of really reminds them of summertime and actually being in Iran. So like I said, if you want to use the vanilla ice cream instead, there are people who don't really like rose water. So if you don't want to use rose water, you can just use vanilla ice cream and kind of get like that little Persian experience with this fun treat. Definitely. I think it's the saffron that is the biggest flavor note in Persian ice cream. So Mm -hmm. you could skip the rose water if you're not a rose water fan easily. Good point. For people who don't like rose water, I know some people I'm close to don't always love rose water. So here's an alternative is that you can actually have vanilla ice cream and garnish it with pomegranate molasses. Oh, So drizzle pomegranate molasses on top of the ice cream and put some chopped pistachios on top and you have a little Persian inspired Mm, dessert. That's really, really clever. You could even put some pomegranate aerials on top. And if you don't have pomegranate molasses, I actually have some date syrup sitting around that I picked up. That Mm -hmm. might be interesting with some walnuts. Yes. Oh, that's a good idea. So I don't have an ice cream maker, but I did recently get gifted with my very first Vitamix. So I've been making my own healthy version of ice cream, basically with a base of bananas. So if you could take a frozen banana and obviously peeled, so frozen bananas and a little tiny bit of a liquid, it could be water or a milk or an almond milk or something. You can pretty much add anything in there and make like a soft serve. Really any blender will work. You can even use a Cuisinart. But I'm now curious to kind of take some of these Persian flavors and the trendy thing to call these banana soft serves Uh that are dairy-free is nice cream. So I kind of want to make Persian nice cream. Yeah, please do and report back on how that goes. You don't think that banana would overpower the other flavors? It is not overpowering, no. I mean, if you're completely 
not a banana person, you can use other things to make a soft serve smoothie. You can use avocado. I don't think that would really work with Persian <laughs> flavors. Riced cauliflower is another one. Cashews. Oh, wow. There's some things you can play with to make a creamy ice cream or nice cream, we should say. Uh But bananas work the best and they don't overpower. And especially with saffron and rose water, I don't think you would taste the banana. I'll report back. Mm, That's awesome. Just a logistical thing. Do you peel the banana before you freeze it or do you freeze it whole? Peel the banana before you freeze it, yes. Okay. And wait until the banana has the little specks. Bananas, as they oxidize... And as they get ripe, they get sweeter. So you want to keep your bananas out on the shelf until they start to get the little, just the little spots on them. That means that they're sweet enough to peel and put in a big Ziploc bag and use for your, your nice cream. Cool. Sounds great. Yeah. Definitely let us know how that goes. Yeah, I will. So do we have an ask the beats question today? Yeah, we do. We have an ask the beats from Megan from New York city. And Megan asks, how do you bloom saffron? We actually talk about saffron a bunch and we talk about using bloom saffron, but maybe we could just give a refresher to Megan and anyone else who doesn't know of how to actually bloom saffron when you want to cook with it. I mean, that's a great question. You know, in my personal learning to cook Persian food journey, I admit to in the early days of learning to cook as a young adult, not knowing what to do with the threads of dried saffron. So again, saffron is sort of the inside of a flower. Mm -hmm. A specific flower that grows in Iran. They're like bright orangey red threads that are in the middle of these bright purple flowers. And those are all hand harvested. And those, when you bloom them, they have a beautiful golden yellow color. So blooming it really brings out the color of it. Yeah, I used to take the dried saffron and literally like sprinkle it onto my rice and then it would be like bright orange and just certain spots of the rice and I'd be like, why isn't this dissolving and looking beautiful like right. when I go to these parties? So yeah, it took me a long time to figure it out. I personally take the beautiful dried saffron threads and I take it and I put it in a hard bottom small ramkin or bowl And then I simply take like the back of a spoon and I grind it down however much I need. Uh I boil some water. So it takes very little saffron to get a vibrant color and nice aroma. So for maybe like an eighth of a teaspoon of saffron and about a tablespoon of boiling water, I get a good dissolved bloomed saffron, which I can then mix into recipes or pour onto my rice. How about you? So pretty much, I mean, I think what you're explaining is just the equivalent to like a mortal or pestle to grind up the dried threads of saffron to turn it into a powder. You can do that kind of individually as you need it. Or what you can do sometimes when, like, when I get like a package of saffron, I'll go ahead and grind all of it. And actually at my mom's house, she has a designated little mini coffee grinder that she has just for saffron. (laughs) So I'll usually take it over there and grind up the whole package at once and have it in a nice little jar that I keep on the shelf. But I remember talking to you about this, that I really should keep my saffron in the freezer to keep it more fresh. So I, I need to do that. But yeah, I grind it up. And then again, you just add the hot water to it. I think it's better if you don't use like boiling, boiling water, if you just let your boiling water sit for like a minute or two, so it's not fully boiling. So it doesn't like kind of burn the saffron, a few tablespoons of hot water, again, depending on how much you're using. And then you just let it kind of sit and seep and basically bloom. I like to just cover it with something. And, you know, after a few minutes, you'll see that the color of the saffron all comes out and it turns into like kind of like an orangey liquid, liquid gold, really. I love using my saffron for tadik, adding it to the rice. I actually like adding it to seafood, also to chicken, or also to this basani that we were talking about. It has a beautiful aroma to it. But yeah, that's pretty much how you bloom it. Actually, what I probably do more than anything else is use a saffron spray. So a traditional old school Persian chef would maybe be against doing this. Uh I know some people don't like the results, but for me, it comes out, it's strong, it's nothing but saffron, and it is really easy to use. And so the only thing is that the measurement's a little harder to do. Sometimes I'll try to spray it into a a measuring teaspoon so I know for my recipes that I'm creating. But Uh to me, it gives a good vibrant color. You can layer it on as well. You can layer it on the rice and get it as light or dark as you like. It's really nice. Yeah, and that's 100% saffron, so that's great. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So this has been fun. I can't wait to have Baseni this season. And I hope that people are inspired to make their own either real version or cheap version. But if anyone does make it, please let us know. Tag us on your pictures on Instagram or send us a note and show off your pictures. And we'd love to see that. And we'll share it with our audience as well. Excellent. Thank you, Bita Jun. Thank you, Bita Jun. Until next time. Bye. You've been listening to the Modern Persian Food Podcast with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you've enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling a friend or giving us a good rating. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app or find us online at modernpersianfood.com or on Instagram for the recipes and information we talked about today. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time.